Hello, I'm Andrew Jenks. I'm a board member of the John Francis Foundation and I teach at the University of Minnesota. I teach GIS and GPS and I'm also the president of a ski trail and I've had lots of experience in wilderness navigation and wilderness safety. Now the map and compass, the key in the map and compass is to start with a good map. Now if you're uh, hiking in the boundary waters or you're paddling, canoeing in the boundary waters, there's two, there's three different map series that you want to uh, consider. And you can get these at REI, get these at Joe's, get these at uh, Midwest, get it at many outfitters uh, or over the internet. Uh, the companies are McKenzie, makes uh, one that's very, very popular. Another is Fisher and another is Voyager. And they all are, uh, they all do the same thing. Uh, they have slightly different scales, slightly different colors, uh, but they all work. Uh, the important thing is get one of them. <laughs> Uh, and that have that uh, because it shows the lakes, it shows the canoe routes, it shows the portages, it shows distances, and uh, they're uh, very, very useful. Now, in the example I'm showing here, I'm using the McKenzie map, and I'm talking about uh, McKenzie map 18. Uh, and the first thing you want to notice on, uh, when you're looking at any of these maps, the Fisher, the Voyager, or the McKenzie, is the scale, and that is how many units on the map relate to units on the ground. So if you're, you're traveling an inch on the map and the scale is uh, 31,000, you'd be traveling 31,000 inches on the ground. That, the the uh, map scale is, is unitless. It basically, the units on the map translate to the units on the ground based on the scale. So you'd want to get an idea of how far you're, uh, you're planning to go based on the scale of the map. And oftentimes the scale of a map uh, is such a, a medium scale map, you have to walk quite a distance to, uh, to move very far on the map uh, because of the scale. So, so there, there's some things you'd want to get used to to have a scale that you can really understand. Uh, and in this case, one inch equals uh, 31,000 <laughs> inches. So that would be quite a ways. And the scale bar is at the bottom, and the scale bar is something you'd want to notice uh, and, and pay attention to on the map. And if you uh, pick up uh, other, the Fisher maps or the Voyager maps, they have slightly different scale, and you'd want to be aware of uh, the, the scale. The other piece that's in the bottom and the lower left is a legend, and this tells you what the things are on the map. Uh, obviously, the lakes and the land masses are clear, but the, the t various trails and the other features on the map are, are clearly identified in the legend at the bottom. Now, the... Um, the, and I've got some uh, extra notes here talking about the scale of this particular map. And here we're talking about two inches uh, equaling a mile on the ground. So you'd want to get an idea of uh, how far a mile is on the ground, maybe some experience walking a mile. You might want to walk in your neighborhood and get a feeling for what a mile feels like. And, uh, and that get the idea that you'd be moving two inches on this map when you're uh, moving, uh, when you're traveling a mile. This is, this is a, a constant problem with maps uh, being uh, set at a particular scale where they don't show the detail. When you're on the ground, you see the little twists and turns of a trail, but on the map, you don't see those and you get confused. And that's because the scale of the map. If you had a, a, a map that was the same scale as you're walking, you would, have a, uh, you would have a huge, huge map. So there's just assumptions that are made about scale uh, for, uh, for mechanics. Now, the, the next step that we want to talk about in uh, land navigation in the boundary waters or water navigation in the boundary waters is traveling uh, from point A to point B. Now, the uh, example that I'm giving here is moving from one campsite to another campsite. Now, in this particular case, we'll actually be traveling on the water rather than traveling on the land, but we could be traveling on the land uh, <clears throat> in another situation. So we're, we're moving from A to B. So the first thing we want to do when we're traveling from A to B is to identify those two points. And it often is helpful to position the map so that north is actually facing up. Uh, the top of a map is always north, okay, uh, the, by convention. So, uh, so you don't absolutely have to orient the map to the to north, but sometimes it helps you in the landscape, is to spread the map out on the ground or on the table or on your car, and uh, and point the the top of the map to the north. And you could use your compass to to look that, and that helps you get oriented a little bit in the landscape. So then then what we would do is you would. Um, place a, a ruler on the map. And many compasses have a particular ruler 
uh, along the edge of the compass that uh, measure, uh, that let you measure distance. And in this case, you would measure the distance from A to B in inches or centimeters or whatever uh, units uh, that you feel comfortable with. Uh, we're talking about inches. And then we would use the uh, map scale. We would take those inches and we would convert those to the, uh, um, the travel, your distance you'll be traveling on the ground. And in this case, uh, we're uh, going to be traveling from A to B at 2.4 miles, okay? Now, we want to be thinking about 2.4 miles. How fast can you paddle? Uh, how much energy do you need? How much water? Uh, what the weather condition? You know, there's, so now you know the distance you have to travel. You say, well, if I'm going to be paddling at one mile an hour, that means, or two miles an hour, that means I'm going to be out on the lake for an hour. So I need to make sure I know the weather conditions, I have the right energy, I have my PFD and safety equipment, you know, those sorts of things. So the, the distance uh, can help you uh, gauge the right amount of energy and resources. Uh, now, the, the next thing that we, we want to talk about is when you get to point A or point B, uh, how far the portage is. Oftentimes in the boundary waters, you're traveling from one lake to another. And, uh, and in between the lake, you have to get out of your canoe and transfer your equipment to the uh, other, the next lake, and then carry your boat. And we use the word portage, and it, we refer to it as portage. It's really in French, it's portage, but it's uh, it's carrying your boat and your gear, very much like the voyageurs would have done hundreds of years ago. Now, on most maps, and this is true with Fisher as well as Mackenzie and as well as uh, the uh, uh, voyageur, uh, they're marking all the portages in some odd units. And this confuses a lot of people, uh, but the units relate to uh, very old uh, traditional measurements. And they refer to, in this particular case, they refer to this portage uh, as 141 rods. Now the question is, what the heck is a rod? Well, a rod is 16 feet, right? And it had to do with an old measurement uh, uh, process that went on uh, from the 1600s. And so if you want to figure out how far that is, you're going to have to multiply 16 times 141 uh, to get that, that in feet or some sort of units. And you'd want to uh, get, gauge your amount of energy you have to go through uh, to carry your equipment in your canoe for that sort of distance. Now on this map, we also show contours, and those are lines of equal elevation. And the contours uh, give you an idea of when you're going uphill and when you're going downhill. And if the contours are very close together, that means it's either very steep up or very steep down. And you might want to keep that in mind when you're traveling and you're planning your trip over, uh, over that distance. So you estimate the time, you estimate the distance, transferring from rods, and you get an idea of what the terrain might be as you move from lake to lake. So uh, how long is the portage? So we figured that out. It's almost half a mile, 0.44 miles. So that's a pretty long portage that you'd have to carry the canoe and carry your gear. So you'd want to be prepared to do that. There are certain packs that you can uh, acquire that were often referred to as, they have the name Duluth Pack, an early company that made these, where you, you can easily store your gear all in one pack and carry it over that portage. Uh, along with your canoe, okay? And the legend is uh, where you'd be able to, to understand a little more about those uh, other features on the map. In this case, the contours or some of the other uh, materials that you might encounter on the ground. And in this case, the legend has some information showing you the symbols that are used for bogs or marshes uh, that are open water as well as a bog or marsh that has timber in it. So uh, there's also symbols you can see there about dams and rapids and various different types of trails. So the legend is very useful. So on the uh, portage or on your camp, near your campsite, you could uh, understand what the land type is around you or nearby or that you might need to travel through. So the legend provides a lot of good information for you. Okay, now we're gonna be looking at just the, the little, talking a little more about the, the map that you're looking at here. Uh, and we're looking at this area in yellow, the, the, looking at that in detail. Now, this particular area has a couple of different features in it. And uh, in this case, we use the legend to understand where the, the treeless bog marsh is 
and that might be an area that you could pass through in a canoe or maybe you'd have to wade through if you're traveling through. The, the bog marsh with timber might be a little more difficult because there might be uh, plant material actually uh, woody plant material within the bog so it might be a much more of a tangle uh, but the, you want to be aware that the legend shows you that uh, the, the land cover that you could encounter. The other thing that the legend is showing you is this idea of contours that I mentioned earlier. A contour is a line of equal elevation and uh, you, the legend tells you the units of the contours. In this case 20 feet. The contour would be 20 feet. So each line uh, is another change in elevation of 20 feet, either going up or down. And you've got to sort of look, take a look at it to see whether you think it's going up or down uh, a hill, but it's definitely a change. And if the contours are very, very close together, that's probably <laughs> indicating it's a cliff. So you might want to be very careful as you're looking at contours and the terrain that you have to travel through. Okay. Now, uh, we're, we're traveling uh, from A to B and we measured that distance. Uh, now we want to talk about the direction or how to actually do that, uh, to actually perform that, that, uh, uh, that paddle from the campsite to the portage. So the, the next thing we need to do is to talk about a compass, is because when, when we're out on the water, there's no trail. So that we, and oftentimes when you're uh, heading towards a, a port, something in the wilderness, there isn't something you can see. Every tree uh, uh, looks the same along the side of a, a, a lake or a river. So that you really have to have some way to steer. Um, and there isn't some convenient uh, device like a water tower or a, a church steeple or something like that that you can head for. So you really need to understand your direction. So we're gonna need to talk about the compass. Now, the compass, most people use it to turn, uh, to tell the direction of which way is north. We want to make sure you pick up something a little more sophisticated than that, which would be an orienteering compass, the one on the left. Orienteering compass has a, has a dial on it that you can turn and an arrow of direction on the plate. And you'll notice along the side on the upper right on that plate in the picture that it also has an inch scale. And that could be used for the earlier exercise where we're talking about the distance between the campsite and the portage. Okay, so, so that's the compass. Now what we want to do is talk about the compass itself and how the compass measures units. Now, uh, modern compasses all measure units in 360 degrees or azimuth. Okay, zero meaning north, uh, due east meaning 90, due south meaning 180, and due west being 270, and then back up north at 360 or zero. Okay, so that's an azimuth. So if I asked you to go due south, you would be heading 180 in a, in a uh, degrees. Okay, um, so you get the idea of an azimuth angle. So on our map, what we need to do is we need to identify point A and point B and understand that we want to travel from point A to point B and we're going to be uh, using some features that are on the map. Now if you'll examine the map, and this is true with the McKenzie and the Fisher and the, uh, as well as the uh, Voyager maps, they all have north-south lines. You want to remember the top of a map is north, okay? And that on the map there often are grid lines or north-south lines that are, that are faintly visible. Uh, from the bottom to the top. And I've got them marked here in the picture with the little arrow that says north-south grid line. So what you're going to do is you're going to place the compass on the map, okay, and you use the compass base plate to, uh, to um, connect your line between A and B, point A and B, all right? So, so when you place the compass in this fashion, what you'll want to do is turn the little black dial, okay, to line up the parallel lines that are behind that uh, little dial, line those parallel lines up with the, uh, the north-south lines that are printed on the map, okay? And then uh, once you've got them, the parallel lines that are in the turning part of a compass lined up with the north-south lines, the grid lines on the map, you're able to read your bearing or your azimuth uh, from your uh, red direction arrow, okay? And in this case, We've got it placed, we lined them up, and you can see that we have to travel 324 degrees. So that from point A to point B, that's 324 degrees. Now, we're not talking about, uh, the, we're just assuming all magnetic, uh, we're not talking about any de declination here, we're just using the Earth's magnetic field to figure this out right now. 
um, it's a separate topic to talk about the, the discrepancy between true north and magnetic north. But in Minnesota, they're very, they're almost the same. When you're off the grid, communication can be a real problem. Uh, many people are using their smartphones now for all sorts of things, uh, but uh, the smartphone doesn't work everywhere. Uh, and it doesn't have cell coverage, and even if you have some offline maps cached, uh, it, uh, it isn't uh, able to help you in all situations. And so what we're seeing and what we're recommending in the John Francis Foundation, uh, that you consider some off-network communication options. And there's sort of three families of these types of uh, off-network uh, communications. The, very, the, the leading vendor, the um, main vendor in this is the Garmin, which is a maker of GPS, um, and they have a product called InReach. And the InReach is pictured on the left. There's several models of it. There, uh, uh, the, the, there's also a vendor uh, the, which is called Spot, which provides a similar. And then there's another category called uh, PLBs, or a personal locator beacon. And uh, they all have strengths and weaknesses, and we want to sort of talk through it a little bit. The Garmin uh, InReach product is the one we recommend and the one we loan out to people and we've been doing the most work with. And the reason we're using the Garmin InReach is because that it sends messages and receives messages. It's a two-way communication. So basically it's a satellite texter. So it's not a... Uh, and the, uh, the Garmin InReach product also has an app that you could work with your smartphone, whether it's Android or iOS, uh, that you could use your smartphone as a front end or as a, as a tool, you know, paired with it through Bluetooth. But the primary communication and the information goes through the Garmin InReach. And the Garmin InReach sends signals to the telecommunications uh, satellite network in low Earth orbit from the Iridium network. And Iridium is the main vendor for sat phones um, but so basically you want to think of this as a sat texting device so satellite phone texting and it's very inexpensive compared to a sat phone and there's the older version and the new version now uh, the because this uh, this information is up uh, on the web or through the satellite network it also provides a, a web feed so that as you're sending messages uh, receiving messages uh, people on the ground can actually see where you are. So there's a, a way people in your base camp or your family could follow your, your travels uh, through this simple text messages that you're sending in the wilderness. This particular product has some rates, and we want to update these rates. These are the rates as of a, a little while ago. But it's, it's, a, it's about $15 to $16, $17 a month on the low end side, uh, up to about $30 a month. Uh, there's various different levels and they give you a certain number of text messages uh, for the package, and then it's 50 cents a message above that. Uh, but you'd want to look into it. All of this ties into the, uh, the various search and rescue uh, services that exist in the world. Search and rescue is an international uh, service that uh, 40 or 50 countries have got together in a treaty and have created an a international search and rescue uh, a process and infrastructure. And this uh, inReach product ties into that. And actually, so if you push the emergency, the 911 or the, uh, the emergency button on it, it actually goes into the GOES uh, search and rescue, the international search and rescue process. And they notify the local uh, sheriff or the local people that there's an emergency. And then the local uh, or the appropriate resources, whether it be the Coast Guard or whether it be the, uh, the, the local uh, law enforcement, they would actually begin the search uh, if you push the emergency piece of it. Now an alternative to this, which is a, a little bit cheaper, uh, and a number of organizations have chosen this, and this is the SPOT. And SPOT has been a product for a long time that uses a satellite. It uses a similar satellite system. It uses a Global Star satellite system. Uh, but it only sends messages so that you're able to push the button and send a message to say, I'm okay or I need help. So it's a one-way communication. Now, uh, some of the uh, newer pieces of the spot uh, messenger service, uh, they're talking about adding a two-way to it because there's quite a bit of demand for the two-way. But at a little cheaper price, you're able to get this one-way uh, message. 
Um, I, we found within emergency situations, when you send an emergency message, it's very helpful to know that somebody got the message, and it's also helpful to be able to have an exchange back and forth with the rescuers uh, to explain your condition and what the situation is. But, uh, but the spot is a, is a good alternative. It's sure better than nothing, you know, to, uh, to send the satellite. Now, the, the sort of the fallback, and this is a, the, um, the service that's been available for many years and it's used widely in navigation, uh, is the PLB. And basically this is a device that you push the button and it sends out a little beep, a little message into the satellite system saying, I need help. And uh, they used to be just sending a little message that some uh, airplane or some searcher would pick up, a little beacon, if you will. Uh, now the new technology actually provides the GPS location that's going out in the little beacon message. Uh, so it actually provides your, the GPS location as well as your message. But somebody's got to know to check or somebody's got to be able to check this and there's no confirming con communication and it, it is a, um, a sort of push and wait type of situation. It, it's very common in some boats, when the boat tips over, it gets activated and the beacon gets activated. So even if some person wasn't even uh, functioning, when the boat went over, it, the beacon would go off and the people would be notified in the Coast Guard. So it's sort of a simple rescue beacon, uh, a one way with the spot or the, um, the inreach. So there's a, a couple of different uh, uh, options with this. Uh, in this off-grid technology. The important thing is you think about it before you go and that you uh, test it, uh, get something going, and you find something that meets your budget and you tell your, uh, your family about uh, what you're using so you'll be, they'll be able to use that uh, to track your progress or in the case of some emergency. But basically this satellite communication has changed the search and rescue from uh, search and rescue to actually just rescue because the information as to your position is being provided through these various satellite services. Now, how's the location? Well, of course, all these devices have GPS built inside them. So they have their GPS position and then they use the satellite communication. Uh, and these are the satellite communication satellites, not the navigation satellites. Uh, they relay the messages to the various search rescue party. Uh, this completes this, uh, this piece. Uh, thank you very much.